Good afternoon. My name is Helen Jackson. I'm the designated federal official for the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. Before we begin the meeting today, I would like to remind everyone that the NSTAC is a federal advisory committee governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. This meeting is open to the public, and members of the public are provided an opportunity to provide oral or written comments on current NSTAC activities as outlined in the Federal Register Notice. No requests for comments were registered for this call, but written comments will be accepted at any time. Please address them to the designated federal officer following the instructions as described in the Federal Register Notice. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. You may begin with opening remarks. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark McLaughlin. I'm the NSTAC Chair. I'd also like to introduce uh, Ms. Renee James, the NSTAC Vice Chair. Thank you for taking the time to be here today for the 2015 NSTAC Annual Meeting. It's a pleasure to see everyone. I'd also like to recognize several of our distinguished government partners participating today, including Secretary Jay Johnson from the Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Michael Daniel, Special Assistant to the President and Cybersecurity Coordinator, Ms. Suzanne Spaulding, uh, Undersecretary for National Protection and Programs Director at DHS, and Dr. Phyllis Schneck, Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity at DHS. Thank you very much for joining us here today, and we look forward to your contributions. In addition, I'd also like to welcome the NSEP Communications Executive Committee, or XCOM members, who will be participating in this afternoon's discussions. And with us today, we have uh, Dr. Andy Osmond, Department of Homeland Security and XCOM co-chair, Mr. Terry Halverson, Department of Defense and XCOM co-chair, Mr. Stephen Taylor from the Department of State, Mr. Joseph Klimovitz from the Department of Justice, Ms. Angela Simpson, NTIA Department of Commerce, Mr. Brett Armstrong, General Service Administration, Mr. Eric Panketh, from the Federal Communications Commission, and Mr. Alan Royal, Office of the Director of National Intelligence. As you may recall, the NSTAC last met in February via conference call, and during that meeting, we received our tasking to examine big data analytics. Dr. Schneck discussed rel recent cybersecurity legislation at that time and updated the NSTAC on DHS initiatives, such as the CQB Voluntary Program and the DHS Weather Math Concepts. Thank you for that. For today, we have uh, several key items on the agenda. Our first order of business, we're delighted to host Secretary Johnson uh, for a keynote address before lunch. After his remarks, we'll break for lunch. Uh, then we're gonna conduct a panel discussion with the NSEP Communications Executive Committee, during which we'll examine some current challenges and priorities related to NSEP Communications. Following the panel, we'll receive an update on the government's progress <coughs> regarding the NSTAC recommendations from Dr. Schneck, and we'll complete the afternoon by discussing current NSTAC activities, and Lisa Hook and Bill Brown will provide an update on the progress of the NSTAC Big Data uh, Analytics Scoping Subcommittee that they're co-chairing. So I encourage everybody to please offer their uh, insights and thoughts to, uh, to your afternoon, and we will end at uh, 1400 on schedule. And um, before turning over to Secretary Johnson, I'd like to see if, uh, Renee, you have any remarks you'd like to make. No, thank you. I think we're running behind. So with that, <laughs> I'll turn it over to the Secretary. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to address the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee and all others in the room. I learned this morning that this advisory committee was created in the fall of 1982 by President Reagan. In 1982, as I'm sure many of you know, there was no cable TV available in Washington. Uh, no building in this city was wired, depending upon how you define it. There was no internet yet, uh, no cell phones, as best to the best of my recollection, uh, no smartphones, no Blackberries, no Google, no Facebook, no Flickr, no YouTube, no Twitter, and of course my favorite, no Yik Yak. Um, we've come a long way, and my department, as all of you know, was formed in the wake of September 11, 2001. We are the newest cabinet level department. We were passed into law by Congress in 2002. We stood up in 2003. Counterterrorism was and is the cornerstone of our department's mission. But in 2015, um, I think we all recognize that cybersecurity is and must be a mission of my department of equal importance. And it is a major agenda item of mine to address cybersecurity of President Obama's, as I think many of you here know, and our departments. So I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about what we in the Department of Homeland Security and in the interagency are doing to address cybersecurity along with the good work that is being done around the table here. 
Under the leadership of Undersecretary Suzanne Spaulding, Deputy Undersecretary Phyllis Schneck, and Andy Osmond, we are, in my judgment, building a more agile and responsive cybersecurity capability in DHS. Much of that activity centers around the acronym that all of you know as NCIC, the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. The NCIC is a busy place. In 2014 alone, the NCIC received over 97,000 cyber incident reports from the private and government sectors and issued nearly 12,000 cyber alerts or warnings. We have it. The NCIC identified numerous vulnerabilities. Last year, for example, we identified 265 instances of the heart bleed vulnerability across dozens of departments and agencies of the U.S. government and within a three-week period managed to reduce them to just two. Other vulnerabilities we helped the private and government sectors address last year were shell shock, black energy, Havex, back off point of sale, and Lenovo Superfish. My goal is to move the NKIC to an even higher and more aggressive and efficient level, to make it an even better 24-7 cybersecurity operations center with the government and business working side by side. In my view, uh, and this is sort of the, my, my, the, the, the basic mindset that I approach cybersecurity, government does not have all the answers. We certainly don't have all the talent. Therefore, cybersecurity must be a partnership between the government and the private sector and the experts, including those around the table. We need to develop partnerships. We need to encourage the growth of technology and capabilities in the private sector. Um, and we in DHS need to attract talent. When I was at the RSA conference last month, I announced that we are uh, preparing to open an office in Silicon Valley. Uh, a week later, Ash Carter announced that the Department of Defense was offering an office in the Silicon Valley. It's like law firms all coming to the Silicon Valley. Um, <clears throat> we intend to hire a new director soon for the NKIC. Uh, we're making an effort to attract a real all-star to that position, well known to you. And the NKIC director will have a direct reporting line to me in terms of information sharing um, and, and threat reporting. We are enabling the NKIC now to provide near real-time automated information sharing to the private sector. I've directed our team to move full throttle on this. Last month, we deployed the capability to automate publication of cyber threat indicators in a machine-readable format. We reached this major milestone five weeks ahead of deadline. Today, we're sharing indicators with an initial set of companies and in the process of adding others. Later this year, we expect to be in a position to begin to accept cyber threat indicators from the private sector in automated near real-time format. Congress, as all of you know, is active in considering cybersecurity legislation. There was cybersecurity legislation passed in the last session, late last year. The National Cybersecurity Protection Act of 2014 codifies into law the role of the NCIC as the federal civilian interface with the private sector. Congress has also passed legislation to help us in DHS hire highly skilled cybersecurity talent. We want to go further. So in January, the President came to the Department of Homeland Security to our NCIC to announce his administration's position on cybersecurity legislation. Uh, we support legislation to establish the NCIC as the primary portal through which the private sector should pass cyber threat indicators to encourage the private sector to share cyber threat indicators with the NCIC. We've also announced our support for legislation to protect from civil and criminal liability businesses that provide cyber threat indicators to the NCIC. Uh, we support a national data breach reporting system in lieu of the existing patchwork of state laws on the subject. We've also issued a number of executive orders to strengthen cybersecurity. The President's been active in this area. In February 2013, he signed Executive Order 13636 to promote information sharing and cybersecurity best practices. And we have created the Homeland Security C Cubed Voluntary Program, as well as the Department of Commerce's Cybersecurity Framework 
In February 2015, this year, the President signed Executive Order 13691, directing the Secretary of Homeland Security, me, to encourage the further development of private information sharing and analysis organizations, or ISAOs. Currently, the government and industry work together through information sharing and analysis centers, or ISACs, which are based on the 16 critical infrastructure sectors. Many of the ISACs have been successful, but they don't fit every company's needs. In February 2015, the President also directed the creation of a Cyber Threat Intelligence Integration Center. Last month, or month before last, he also signed Executive Order 13694, which authorizes the Secretary of Treasury to impose financial sanctions on the worst of the worst who engage in malicious cyber-enabled activities that are a threat to national security, foreign sovereign, foreign policy, the economic health or financial stability of our country. In matters of cybersecurity, the Department of Homeland Security is also involved in a law enforcement role through the Secret Service, through Homeland Security Investigations. The Coast Guard has a role in cybersecurity by working to protect our maritime transportation system from cyber-related threats. I have pledged to the private sector and to my interagency partners that we will work together in a collaborative, cohesive fashion, uh, that there be no turf battles between and among government agencies when it comes to cybersecurity. And we work closely with the FBI, DOD, and others. Jim Comey, uh, the director of the FBI, is a friend of 26 years from when we were young prosecutors together in Manhattan. Um, the Secretary of Defense, when I was general counsel of the Department of Defense, used to be my client. Uh, we worked together closely for four years. Finally, I want to address the issue of uh, encryption. This is something that we in the administration are, are, are thinking about, and we solicit, we solicit your help, we solicit your views on the proper balance between encryption and the law enforcement need, the national security need. The course we're on is taking us deeper and deeper into encryption in response to the demands of the marketplace. This presents law enforcement and national security challenges. We all understand, I understand, the President understands the importance of what encryption brings to privacy. But imagine a world well after the advent of the telephone in which the warrant authority of the U.S. government extended only to the U.S. mails. The fact is encryption is making it harder for government to find criminal activity and potential terrorist activity. And this is not just the federal government. We're also talking about state and local law enforcement. So we want to find a solution to this dilemma. We want to find a balanced solution that takes account, full account, of the privacy rights and expectations of the American public and the cybersecurity of the American public as well as American businesses. We want balance. Homeland Security, in my view, is striking the right balance between basic physical security and preserving our values, the values of privacy, freedom to travel, freedom to associate. Uh, we celebrate diversity in this country. And so what I frequently tell audiences is I can build you a perfectly safe city uh, in the name of Homeland Security, but it's going to look like a prison. So Homeland Security is striking the right balance between the things we value, our laws, our privacy interests, and protecting the American people, protecting ourselves. And that's what we're looking for in this particular con uh, context as well. So I appreciate the opportunity to address this distinguished committee. And um, Mark, thank you again for inviting me. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate it. And listening to the, uh, to the list you rattled off there, the administration's been busy. As, as, as your department, we appreciate uh, the leadership on that, as well as partnership uh, with NSTAC. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank Be you. Before I uh, continue with the agenda, Mike, I want to see if you had any remarks you'd like to make. 
Thank you, Mark. No, the only thing I just wanted to add is to uh, echo my thanks uh, for all the time and effort uh, that the committee members uh, have put in along with uh, your uh, points of contact and the other folks in your companies who've had to work on the various reports uh, that the INSTAC has uh, produced. I think in particular uh, the two most recent ones on the Internet of Things and uh, the IT mobilization uh, are particularly relevant. Um, the, uh, I meant to bring uh, my mobilization one to show Renee that I've got it marked up, um, you know, uh, with things on it. Uh, we are thinking about it uh, and how to uh, incorporate uh, the recommendations uh, into uh, into our thinking and uh, turn them into uh, turn them into action items. Uh, as the list that the secretary rattled off shows that this is a uh, a an area of intense focus for the administration, and we expect it to continue that way. Uh, that we are going to continue to drive uh, policy uh, changes uh, and improvements uh, to improve the government's capability in this area. Uh, and the INSTAC plays a key role in helping us think about how to do that uh, in a way that is most effective not only for the government and for society but for industry uh, as well. So your input uh, is uh, very much valuable and, uh, is, uh, and is being used. Thank you very much, Michael. So, Suzanne, do you have any remarks you'd like to make? Uh, no, no, I don't. I want to echo the thanks to the both of you for your leadership uh, and to this group for the important inputs that they make and uh, help significant uh, as we try to achieve our, our joint mission here. So Great. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, at this time then we're going to break for lunch for 30 minutes and we'll reconvene at 1250. So 10 to 1, please. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, at this time, we're going to move to our next agenda item, which is a panel discussion with the XCOM. Um, as I mentioned this morning, the XCOM was, uh, is a group of uh, eight folks uh, out of government who are uh, working um, on practical matters um, and technology around uh, communications dealing with national security emergency preparedness. So I've asked uh, our Vice Chair, Renee James, if she would uh, host or moderate this panel for us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Renee. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for joining us today for this discussion on the National Security Emergency, uh, Emergency Preparedness Communication Challenges. On our panel today, or our discussion today, we have the NSCP Executive Committee DHS Assistant Secretary Andy Osmet, hello, and DOD CIO Terry Halverson. Thank you, gentlemen, for both joining us. And of course, our Chairman Mark McLaughlin, who is the CEO of Palo Alto Networks, is also going to be part of the panel. The purpose of the discussion today is to engage our XCOM and NSTAC members in a discussion on the committee's activities and approaches to ensuring the survivability and resilience of the NSCP communications and safeguarding its infrastructure. A significant goal of this discussion is to identify opportunities for collaboration and information sharing between the committees as well as between and among industry participants around the table today. I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to give some brief remarks before we start the open discussion. If we could start with you, Andy, please. Thank you. And uh, we may bounce back and forth a little bit more than going one by one that, here. That, um, but uh, appreciate the opportunity to address the NSTAC today. I want to briefly recap some of the problems that we're focusing on in the NSEP space, the National Security Emergency Preparedness Communication space. Um, as uh, Renee noted, we are a more operational group. We bring together the government only in this executive committee that we co-chair. Uh, some of the questions that we're thinking about in this space include um, questions that are currently uh, documented by the, um, let's see, ah, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of a document here, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, some of the questions include things like a 911 text. If you want to text 911, Right now, you get a bounce back. Um, and so uh, we'd like to live in a world where a, a person at an incident can send a text to 911 um, with a picture of what's happening on scene, whether it's a tornado, um, whether it's a, a larger uh, national security crisis, uh, you name it. And that text can be processed by the 911 call center, sent onward perhaps to a first responder who's going on to the scene. Um, and that's just an example of the kind of issues that we're, we're struggling with. Uh, and Terry, I think, has some real-world color to add to that. Um, 
having been on scene for a couple of them, you know, after Katrina, the, the first thing we had to put in was cell towers, drop them everywhere, because that was the communications method um, that, that was most prevalent, and the one we could get back up quickest, and frankly, the one that people had um, that they could use. So I think that points to we've had some changes in the way we are going to have to communicate with, with the American population in, in general. Um, we were having a little discussion here today. We now have bigger demands for data. So, you know, in the old days, the president would come on TV and talk to the nation, or the governor would come on TV and talk to the nation. Andy and I were talking this morning. The number of people that are connected to radio, traditional radio, or traditional television is going down. Um, how do you reach all of those people today? What's the way we want to do that? And have we thought about how you would do that so that you would get, you know, the full range of communications? FCC's done some good work on being able to reach them with texting, you know, and get out. Now, how do you take that to the next level? And I do think that the partnership with industry is the only way that's going to get done. It, we like to go to DOD. We don't own the market space as much anymore, um, particularly in this area. Influencer don't own it industry owns this, so how do we leverage you all to bring us the best solutions in this area? I think that's why this is so important. I, I would add that when you look at our remit rich, writ large, it's how do we make uh, the internet work when we really need it to. It used to be how do we make the phones work when we really need them to, but now the phones and the internet are the same, and at the same time, our demands are for data, not just voice calls. So. Uh, I don't want to belabor the points that we've already made with this group, so I think the group understands uh, the challenges that we're working on. We had a few questions that we wanted to use to kickstart the conversation, but really wanted to hear the group's thoughts um, on are there areas where uh, you think we could usefully collaborate in this space. And I believe our goal here is not to come to a conclusion that this is a question we'll address, but flesh out some potential questions and then have our staff uh, you know, take it to the next level and refine for the group in the future. That's right. Uh, so thank you, Andy. I'm going to stop you there and let Mark make a couple of opening remarks, and then I think we'll circle back on a couple of the topics that you've raised. Yeah, just uh, speaking for on behalf of the NSTAC, uh, we think this uh, hopefully is uh, collaboration efforts here. Uh, the NSTAC, you know, is all private citizens, lots of uh, industry experience and insights that have, have historically been brought to bear. A lot of times in the case of uh, nascent technology, some of the stuff that the NSTAC looked at very recently was more nascent than, uh, than mainstream. I think some of the things that um, you, you folks are dealing with are not in that category. It's more about catching up, uh, you know, with the, the technologies. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of people around the table with a lot of experience on these technologies, and, and hopefully there's a way that we can, can help. So uh, the idea here was if, it, if there are things that you're doing or thinking of where the NSTAC can be helpful, uh, there are potential study topics for us that are extremely relevant to practical things that you're doing. So. Thank you, Mark. So let's move back to something that Terry uh, just raised about emergency preparedness. And as a lot of the technology has migrated to IP-based networks, one of the questions we have um, is, do you think that we're forward-leaning enough in ensuring that in the, in the context of emergency preparedness, we are doing all that we need to do, that the network is robust enough, that it's well deployed. And I'm going to open that up to the two of you because I know both of you have ideas about that. And of course, given the membership of NSTAC, we have many people who can probably join in on that top. So no. <laughs> and what do you think we That's should be doing, it. Mr. Halverson? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think. Continue. Type, yeah, no, th this type of discussion and was, as a starting point is probably one of the first things we really need to do. It is a changing world. It's always tough for us in the, the, the government, I think, to stay right at the edge of technology with, with a few exception areas and warfare areas a little more defined. We, we can do a little better in that. But this is a change not just for the government, it's a change for the whole country. So I do think this has to be partnership and these discussions, uh, when we have them in, in this forum and in other forums where the industry can come in and tell us what you're, you're, you're doing, give us actual recommendations. and. You know, to, to one of the things I would like to see, I'll just throw it out, we're, we're, we're doing a little experiment in, in DOD with cloud computing. And an experiment isn't to, how to do it. The experiment is, for the first time, we're writing industry in to help us write our policies and our rule sets. I think we've got to move to that in, in terms of the actual documents. In some cases, the prescriptive things we tell people to do have got to be combined documents with industry and government today, because it's mostly your equipment 
your applications, your software that, that we're going to use in a lot of these answers. You might know it better. And to open our framework to say, this is the capability I want. I won't, don't want to give you the, any more of the prescriptive solution. I'm almost trying to ban the word requirement even. Here's a capability. Now you give me what's the right way to go and solve some of those problems. So I think that's what that's just, these discussions get us there. I'd give a little bit more context on, on some particular concrete issues we were working on. Uh, the one I mentioned before about that full loop from uh, citizen to 911 call center to first responder, uh, that is part of the National Emergency Communications Plan. So we've laid out this high level vision um, and worked with our, our partners at the state and local government level in particular. But I think coloring in the lines of that vision, a, a lot remains to be done. Uh, the other thing I'd highlight is <clears throat> we have uh, historically had the ability to do priority telephone communications um, and through programs that were called GETS and WPS for uh, landlines and mobile phones respectively. Um, we're now going through the process of upgrading that technology to work in an IP-centric world. Uh, but by and large, we're taking our old concepts and mapping them to the IP-centric world and saying we'll, we'll build it again. Uh, it's not clear to me that we are either taking full advantage of the IP-centric world um, or recognizing that the way we live in this IP-centric world is different enough that we, you know, some of the things we used to need we may just not need anymore. They, um, so it, it's not only what have we not asked for that we should ask for, it's what have we asked for that we should give up um, and because it, it doesn't, it's not relevant any longer. Uh, those are particular areas of interest. Okay. Mark, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, just to make sure we're not losing a point, so uh, some specific asks there, um, um, given the, the uh, nature and state of, uh, or the mission statement of, of NSTAC, as we go through this, of things that could be useful from this body for, you, you just named two topics, right, that you could find useful from this body. I'm sure there's people around the table who have a lot of experience and, and actually are providers, right, for the stuff you talk about, so we can, we can talk through some of that. But if there's, um, uh, you know, NSEC study topics that can come out of that, uh, we'd be interested to understand that. Okay. Um, any comments from any of the members? Anybody want to ask any clarifying questions about emergency response? Preparedness, nothing. We'll go on to the second topic, which is uh, we at the NSTAC as of late have been very focused on cybersecurity issues. And um, I think one of the questions we have for NSCP is what uh, other issues should we be considering in the context of what you're trying to do? Are there additional topics around cybersecurity that overlap with, with your charter that we could be collaborating on? or discussion topics that we should be pursuing? Either Andy or Terry. Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that I'd highlight um, is a key focus for us is always, it's not just resilience, um, it's also priority. Um, and, and the NSTAC has addressed this before. There was a report, um, I think, in 2008 on priority communications in an IP world. Um, you know, I think the landscape has changed in, in many important ways since then, and we've had some conversations just, uh, you know, as part of the, off to the side as part of this group about the differences between priority services and assured services in a mobile world uh, versus in, in a landline world, where a world where you're depending on radio waves um, is very different and susceptible to, to different challenges than a world where you actually have a, a wired connection. Uh, so, you know, for us, We've been focused on priority, and as I mentioned before, voice priority. As we get into the data world, um, if we want to be sending images, you know, uh, emails, um, location data, uh, what does priority mean in that space? And I think we've particularly perhaps not taken full advantage of thinking about what does location data mean in this space. <clears throat> I think the other thing we would talk about, there's a dimension of time to security that we haven't explored. Uh, you know, a topic maybe to look at for a study is <clears throat> So how long in most of these environments do I actually need? What level of security do we need to, to do this? In? I mean, if we're really talking about a national exist, do I, do I care at the level of security that I have to talk at? Do I need it to be more open? How do, I, how do we have that national security? What is the right level of, and I'm not even talking about security to DOD stands, but the security even for privacy data. What, when does it say, okay, at this situation, these rules might have to, to slow down a little bit as you have to handle the national crisis. And how do you bring it right back in when the right time happens? It could be an interesting policy <coughs> discussion for this group. 
What does industry do? And industry will play in all those roles. Thank you. Suzanne's got a comment. Yes, Suzanne. Please. Uh, yeah. It occurs to me, listening to the conversation, that, that similar conversations are taking place in the context of the uh, effort to build out the first nationwide public safety broadband network uh, pursuant to first, uh, you know, under FirstNet. And that the report that this group did uh, to help inform uh, that build out, NSTAC did a report on considerations for uh, cybersecurity and, and other uh, NSEP considerations for FirstNet, that it would be worthwhile going back to that uh, and looking at that and, con in, and, and continuing to keep in touch. They're having many of the same conversations, obviously, about prioritization and what that means uh, and, uh, and how to operate in that environment with regard to both data and ultimately, though not immediately, uh, mission critical voice. Scott. Sorry, go ahead, Scott. Thank you. Uh, from listening to the conversation, it seems like there might actually be four different buckets of stuff. So the first is, you know, what are the primary threats to the resiliency of the networks as they exist today? There's been a lot of talk about, you know, weaknesses and protocols and other things. But from a threat model perspective, what are the most challenging risks to the network? The second theme I'm hearing is, assuming the network is up and running and we're moving to a lot of over-the-top services and the like, how could we leverage the capabilities that exist for NSEP purposes, things like data location or being able to, you know, text photos are just examples of what could be done, but it's not a thorough analysis of what could be done in the time of a catastrophe. And so on one hand, there's how do you protect this stuff? Then the second thing is if it's protected, how do we f use its capability? The third bucket I would argue exists is what, how much of that capability remains when you're in a degraded environment and how do you prioritize which things get priority if the environment's degraded. So if you want to text a photo but bandwidth is down, do you still send the text or do you just send the photo? I mean, you kind of have to make some decisions about that. And then fourth, because national security and emergency preparedness is very much a government function, to what extent are you going to leverage the private sector and COTS, which has been the you know, path for many years, but there are times when governments actually build or catalyze particular things that go beyond what the market's providing. And so having clarity about we need this capability and the market's going to provide this much, but we also need some other things, knowing what those things are and whether you can catalyze the market or build an app yourself is actually part of that equation, I think. Thank you, Mr. Charney. Either one of you want to respond to, to any of the comments? or. I would just add that I think that's a very good set of buckets. Um, I, I think the how do we leverage the capabilities that exist is, is a real part of this question for us, and particularly when those capabilities uh, are evolving rapidly. Um, I think there's an implicit question here that, that we may have missed, which is um, how do we, do we want to replace some of the capabilities that have gone away? Um, and, and that goes to Terry's point, for example, about the president being able to address the nation uh, via TV and, and radio in a world where, you know, people don't do that anymore. People, um, if, we, if we go to that world, um, you know, has that, cap that capability has gone away, do we need to replace it, and if so, how? So I, I would add that as an additional uh, point. The only point I would make, I think we certainly in the government owe a, some answers to your questions about what are, what are we looking for, what would the government invest in. But it would be really interesting to flop that around and say, okay, industry, where do you see gaps that you need the government to play in instead of us kind of telling you where we think we ought to play? So I think that would be a great two-way dialogue. Okay. Mark, any comments? Okay. Any additional comments or questions on that? So, um, oh, oh, sorry, bud, please. Yeah, I, th I think this idea of leveraging what we already have is an interesting one, but um, I think we shouldn't confine our thinking to using the assets we already have in the way we're used to using them. So, for example, um, if, if you want to implement a, a broadcast, actually doing a broadcast is not how Twitter does that every day. 
Um, what's hard is if all the cell towers are down, how do you do broadcast to the citizens? And, um, you know, in fact, at, at the base level, the electronics that people have in their pockets are radio transceivers. And, and they can not only talk to cell towers, they can talk to each other. You know, should we mesh these together during an emergency to propagate a broadcast signal um, to replace the old civil defense broadcast? Um, I think those are the kinds of out-of-the-box thinking we need to do because, uh, you know, lit it would be unimaginable 50 years ago to talk about a situation where every citizen has a UHF transceiver in their pocket, but that's what we have today. And we should think out of the box and, and how to leverage that in emergency situations. I would add on to that as well. Um, one of the things that becomes increasingly important in that space then is, is authentication because in a world where everybody can broadcast, um, the ability to spoof or fake a, a government broadcast is obviously increased. And so whereas before, the likelihood that somebody will, will fake a, a government broadcast that overrides all the TV channels in the nation is, is relatively low. Um, the likelihood that somebody will fake a government pot, uh, broadcast that appears on you know one stream of, of some commercial service is, is not as low at all. Yeah, I, I was talking earlier, you don't want some teenager thinking, oh, this is super Twitter. <laughs> um, and, and so, but as always, it comes down to authentication and it comes down to who has the keys that, auth that authorize such a transmission. And so that kind of design has to be thought about up front to make sure that this is a secure mechanism. There's a comment here as well. You know, just. Uh, there, there are a series of challenges that go along with the move to IP-based communications, and so we think about that from a cyber risk perspective, and then, you know, in the eventuality that the networks are not available, what would you do, et cetera. But there's an even more fundamental issue, which is, you know, that the, the capability, the PSAPs, you know, um, for managing those technologies is so far behind the adoption of technologies in the broader public that as we talk about, you know, all of these things becoming somewhat obsolete, that's still the regime within which most all of them operate today. So some acceleration of next generation 911 is, is actually the first step. Um, and then, you know, all the downstream issues that that then presents could be dealt with. But I mean, we're even in a more fundamental place than that right now. Thank you. Dr. Schneck. So I want to add one more fundamental point, it's <coughs> point to that. <coughs> Excuse me. As we look at how we go from uh, copper to IP and then think back to radio, so going from Twitter to walkie-talkie. Uh, I think the ground break, the fundamental issue here is interoperability. Right? We talk about it a lot, but how are you in an emergency going to assume when somebody's broadcasting one way or even communicating one way? How do you receive that and how do you tell everybody else what channel or even worse, what medium am I going to use? So maybe going back and drawing out a way to more flexibly send uh, your signal and receive it. Thank you. Any, please. Uh, um, Joe Fergus, I understand the, um, the challenge that you face. It seemed to me, however, that there is a need for some kind of a prioritization scheme relative to the challenges that you are mentioning. For example, some items are easier to implement than others. And, um, and if you're going to go in, in, in the prioritization approach, then you can prioritize by way of uh, capabilities or by way of importance. Let's talk about prioritization by way of capabilities. As far as I see, sending 911 text is simply the next generation from where we were in the circuit switch environment to where we are today in the IP environment. That's a no-brainer. We have to do that. What is it going to take for law enforcement and or whomever to get that capability? Is it an, um, an IP switch? Whatever they need to upgrade to, they need to do that. Then that should not be debatable. But as far as NSCP is concerned, is a bigger and more important question, and that is a matter of priority. Under emergency conditions, who gets priority? And how are you going to apply that in the IP world? I think that that's still a bit shaky uh, and, and still open. I recall how we did that in the circuit switch world. Uh, you know, there's a question as to preemption of, of calls and that kind of thing in the circuit switch world, um, which was allowed in the public network. And there's a way to technologically implement the, the, the results without actually 
preempting a call. In the IP world, we're talking about buffers and prioritizing messages in a buffer. How do you do that? And when do you do that? And under what conditions do you do that? I think that's a much complex, more complex issue to deal with than simply the issue of whether or not you're going to send text to 911 locations. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Any additional comments? I want to turn it back over to Mark. and. Um, we invited the two gentlemen to join us today, and we are hearing a lot of potential opportunities to collaborate, certainly on emergency preparedness and around network and, and IP network um, prioritization, et cetera. Going back to the cybersecurity portion of it and the comment about the primary threat models and flagging, what, do you have thoughts on what other things you think NSTAC could be thinking about? Um, well, I think in the context of what we just talked about, um, moving from one fundamental paradigm to another is going to raise some of the issues that we just talked about, uh, like authentication being one of them. So cybersecurity is just the, the, the chance for bad things to happen, right, with, uh, with these new uh, sets of paradigms. So I think it's about um, uh, the specific instance or the specific use that we're, we're dealing with uh, will definitely raise security concerns around our, our possibilities, you know, for security, security concerns around that. So from, um, I think from an NSTAC perspective of uh, hate to always I hate to do things in the negative, right, but of the, you know, basically it sounds like, you know, what are some of those implications if we don't have the systems we're talking about here, right, and um, is, a, is, is kind of how I'm thinking about what, uh, what you guys are, what you need, right, and if we, if we don't get that, there's going to be, the, we're in a bad spot today and it's going to get worse in the future. That's my thoughts. Thank you, Mark. As we um, can kind of conclude in, in some of this dialogue, I guess I'd like to hear around the table um, in response to maybe some, some guidance from Mr. Halverson and Osmond about, from a priority perspective, as you think, want us to go off and our POCs to go off and think about potential topics, you know, what, what is, from your point of view, the top one to three things? And then maybe we can hear from the members so that we can give our POCs some direction on on a potential topic development? So one topic that we have uh, that is fairly well baked already is that vision for uh, uh, the future uh, interaction between first responders and the public and 911 call centers, and that's documented in this National Emergency Communications Plan. Uh, I think there'd be some utility in the, the NSTAC uh, members and your staff looking through that document and um, both validating that you, you think that vision makes sense, um, but also giving us some insights into as we go down that road, um, what are some of the, the challenges that we'll have by relying upon the commercial sector that we may not even be anticipating? Um, that we, we are still thinking about a, a world that is, you know, technology five years ago, ten years ago, name your number. Um, and so we've, we've projected that world forward and, and we've missed something entirely that, that has made, uh, that is fundamental in your world. Uh, Mr. Stratton pointed out the, the challenges, for example, of PSAPs, which are the 911 call centers. Uh, you know, vast majority of those are, are four people or less. Um, and so, you know, one of our challenges, as you pointed out, is going to be the capacity of those PSAPs to themselves uh, incorporate new technologies and evolve in this, this new world. What else are we missing? What else should we be thinking about? Uh, a second one for me is in this uh, priority communication space uh, writ large. Uh, your vision of what the world is going to look like in, in 10 years uh, compared to our vision about how we're going to upgrade and update our existing tools to work in that world, because I don't even know that we're confident in our assessment of what the world will look like in 10 years. Uh, that's a, obviously a tough problem, and so, uh, you know, we may have been, we may be aiming for a future that you don't think is going to ever occur, and that's an important thing for us to know. Terry? I think those, those are two really good priorities. Okay. Any clarification, questions, or comments from the ANSTAC members? Please. I think one of the things I wrestle with as an engineer is it would be better if we could understand the requirements of what are trying to be done. Once you understand the requirements, then you could determine the architecture that's needed, and then you can flow down the system requirements. And so for me, it's really hard to figure out, okay, what are 
what are you really looking for? If somebody could define the 2B state, I think there's enough talent around the room to figure out how to get from where we're at to where you want to be. And, and I'm really having trouble with that 2B state, okay. if that helps. Yeah, that, that, that does, that helps. That'll be a good point of clarification as we um, look to de better define the discussion topics between us. Although I will say, I think it's going to have to be iterative uh, because where we will start will be at a fairly high level. I think part of what, what they're saying is, you know, so we might start with what, what is it we're looking for? We're looking for a way to get emergency information to as many uh, people in the country as we possibly can, as quickly as we can. That may not be specific enough to build an architecture around, uh, but then, but then what, you know, what we're looking for back from this, uh, you know, innovative group around the table is, you know, there's a multitude of ways you would do that, as opposed to us coming to you and saying, we need a way to broadcast via mobile phones to every person. No, that's yeah, helpful. So that, I think that I don't iteration think there's a silver important. bullet answer to this. It's a multiple approach, and then how do you do it that way? So I, I think, um, thank you, Ms. Balding. I think um, we hear, I think I'm hearing interest in the collaboration, and there sounds like there are several opportunity areas for us. So I guess I would turn it back over to our chair um, that we may want to go forward with some study topics. Well, we can, uh, I'll ask our, some of our POCs to get more definition around this and we can talk about it in the uh, August uh, call, so if there's something here. And if, uh, and if anybody has uh, a sense of the way we're gonna communicate in 10 years, I'd like to buy your stock uh, now. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about uh, PSAPs and 911 and text and 911, so I just wanna make sure I uh, kind of get an idea of where, uh, um, people are at in terms of where there needs to be more. So at this point, carriers are all required to provide uh, uh, the routing for texts to get to 911, but obviously not all PSAPs are at the point to where they can receive them. And uh, PSAPs that uh, are at that point, they can, you know, they notify the commission that we're able to receive uh, texts. Um, I mean, in the same way that all the technologies that have been mentioned here were transformative to the industry and for the consumer, um, Text to 911 and rich media sort of text to 911 is very transformational to a PSAP. I mean, if you've sat in a PSAP and you, you realize the volume of calls, the amount of calls that they have to deal with, their computer-aided dispatch, um, the amount of checklists, checklists they have to go through to um, um, make sure that when somebody is relaying certain types of symptoms that they know exactly what instructions to give until the emergency responder gets there, um, being able to receive an image or a text sounds like th this is a no-brainer and it's a very good thing for the country that that happens but um, th this takes time because of how transformational it is for their day-to-day -day operations and uh, so I mean you'll see the bigger peace apps and the well-resourced peace apps be able to achieve these goals um, but you have thousands of peace apps in the country and as you said Andy you know some of them are Four person operations. So I, I just want to caution a little bit. I mean, I, there's the technology that's there, and it's great. And we use this technology every day. Um, some of you are texting right now, I think, about my comments. Um, but um, uh, as far as how that fits into sort of a national emergency communications plan or or, uh, or, or sort of timelines, it, it suggests that maybe the PSAPs aren't meeting some sort of. Uh, uh, um, uh, benchmark, I, I, I just sort of cautioning against that because uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the NSTAC would be able to provide in terms of looking at that issue. We appreciate that. Definitely we want to scope it appropriately if there's anything. And that's uh, Eric from FCC. So uh, there's a lot of experience here. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll take that under consideration, uh, talk with the POCs, and we'll uh, be back on the August phone call with some recommendations about if there's something here that we can, we can be a, assist you guys with that would be, uh, that'd be relevant, meaningful, and that we have the enough exper you know, experience around the table to, uh, to provide you with some insight on. Great. Uh, thank you, Renee, for hosting that. Appreciate that. Um, we're going to turn our attention now to uh, what happens to our reports. Um, so it's very important that uh, for us and <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully thing, things actually happen with them. So I'd like to turn the mic over to uh, 
Phyllis uh, for an update on uh, a couple of the reports we've, we've produced. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. I like that title, What Happens to Our Reports? Um, and I do want to thank everybody greatly. I, I know this is not your day job, but you've made it that at times. The multiple calls, the work on the reports. Um, in my year and a half in government, there's been a lot of work I've gotten to see and learn from this group. So I just want to echo a lot of people's uh, many thanks and for your assistance. And one of the reasons we think this section is, so, uh, is significant is because we, we ask you all day, what would you do? We tell you that we as government need your innovation from the private sector. That's why the West Coast office. Uh, we really want to rely on getting good products in, the best of technology, to do what we do better for you, to enable you to make money, thrive, go forward at the same time we make technology better. And the way we do that through this body is implementing uh, what you work so hard to recommend. So that's why I'm going to go through this in some detail for each report. Um, and this update is, is truly part of our commitment to making sure that we take your advice uh, and try to implement it. Now, sometimes things take time in government, but I think you'll be pleased, hopefully, um, with some of the progress. If you're not pleased, my boss, the Undersecretary, uh, is yes. over here. Um, so first, um, the report to the President on the Internet of Things. And I had the honor and opportunity when I first joined government to work with uh, the team on this and get to hear some of the work that the members were doing on this particular report. Um, so since the report's approval uh, last November, the U.S. Senate unanimously passed a resolution to use the Internet of Things to assist with economic growth. And according to that resolution, the country will develop a national strategy to, quote, incentivize the development of the Internet of Things, prioritize accelerating its development and deployment, and ensure it responsibly protects against misuse. And those are some hard things to accomplish. The Senate also held its first hearing on the Internet of Things this past February, uh, but it shows the timeliness of the report and the thought that went into that. Since the resolution was passed, we at DHS have provided several congressional committees with a copy of the report uh, so they can go back and reference that and also look at how we implement those recommendations. In addition, the Department's National Protection and Programs Directorate, that would be us, has been involved in several Internet of Things related activities. So one is the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, highlighted the IOT during, and I am going to use the acronym here, but highlighted that during our outreach for October's National Cybersecurity Month. And we support, as you know, the Stop, Think, Connect campaign, meaning please don't click on the link for the rest of the country. Um, but really looking at if everything's all connected, showing our general public how important these recommendations are and how important good cybersecurity is going forward. I'm going to go through these fast so I can get through them all so you know we worked on them. But I only have 10 minutes, I believe. Uh, the Industrial Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team, also known as our, our ICS CERT, also recognizes that those systems are increasingly accessible from the Internet. They're the things that are attached. And as you've heard us in our Black Energy Campaign and others, increasingly susceptible. So the CERT personnel are engaged, are engaging cleared asset owners, so the folks that run and operate the water plants, the electric plants, the transportation, um, to look through a classified briefing campaign and address the impacts of recent black energy and other malware, all in the context of these are the devices increasingly out to our refrigerators and toasters, uh, as we were talking earlier, that are connected. Uh, there's been a lot of interest from other departments and agencies across our federal government. So, for example, the NSA acknowledged the importance of the report's recommendations, and they've been hosting internal IoT workshops. And they have two working groups in an effort to minimize the duplication of work and streamline efforts. One group is focusing on the coordination of the agency's IoT strategy, and the other focus on the actual technology and the concepts they're in. So overall, it's a global issue as well. Some of our foreign partners, including uh, GCHQ, uh, the British government's equivalent of some of us, uh, NS or NSA's British counterpart, have also requested a copy of that report and to leverage also your work. So it's going far. Um, very quickly, the NSTAC report to the President on Information and Communications Technology Mobilization from this past November 2014. Since that report's approval, we reviewed uh, the report and encouraged government and industry to work together and collaborate on cyber responses. Uh, chiefly through our CyberStorm 5 exercise. And within that exercise, we'll provide an opportunity for our NKIC, our National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, I call it the watch floor, um, for those to include NSTAC members to both highlight and evaluate our unified response and collaboration as, as you mapped it out in your report. Um, the goal of these exercises, and especially this one, is to strengthen our preparedness to exercise what we would do and when, maybe leverage some of the systems that Dr. Osmond and Mr. Halverson were talking about. Um, in addition, one of the objectives is to continue to exercise all of our coordination mechanisms, our info sharing, our development of shared situational awareness. You've, you've all heard this before. You've all recommended it. Uh, we practice it. We make it real. 
And in CyberStorm 5, we're utilizing uh, this report as one of the guiding documents as to how we build out the exercise and how we identify key players within the ecosystem and how they interact. Regarding the report to the President on secure government communications from, from August 2013, uh, before I was here, but since the NSTAC approved the report in August, DHS and the White House, or the ex Executive Office of the President, have reviewed the report's recommendations, encouraged departments and agencies to review the report, and implement the recommendations as appropriate. And the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, the NIP from 2013, partnering for critical infrastructure security and resilience, outlined 10 actions across and to guide the critical infrastructure community. And one of those actions was to establish a national focus through joint pro uh, jointly developed priorities. Uh, in 2014, DHS also released the Joint National Priorities for Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience based on your recommendations. And in that report, the critical infrastructure community is encouraged to implement the, the exact recommendations that you put forth in your report. And we'll continue to leverage the findings in, in that one going forward. Uh, regarding the NSTAC report to the President on the national security and emergency preparedness implications of a nationwide public safety broadband network so pertinent to the past conversation. But since that report was released, the First Responder Network Authority, or FirstNet, the independent entity within the Department of Commerce charged with building, operating, and deploying the national broadband network has continued to grow. It's launched a formal consultation process with the states and began consultations with federal agencies. And the Undersecretary is, I believe you're driving that. Um, regarding the recommendation on coordinating organizational roles, responsibilities, and relationships, the Emergency Communications Preparedness Committee, the ECPC, the Interagency Clearinghouse for Interoperable and Operable Communications established a, co a consultation focus group to enable federal interagency requirement inputs into FirstNet's planning process. Uh, in essence, we took everything you told us and it's part of the governing body that's driving what's going to happen as we develop this. Regarding the recommendation on policy changes, the NSCP Communications Executive Committee, the XCOM that Andy co-chairs as part of its authorities under Executive Order 13618, recognizes the importance of aligning NSCP and public safety communications and is working on these issues through its NSCP Communications Policy Subtask. Regarding the recommendations on technology initiatives, um, the NPSTC, or the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, there's a quiz, NPSTC published a public safety grade report in 2014 with 435 recommendations on network design, site hardening to, to distinguish a public safety grade system from a commercial grade system. We're also updating the 2012 local control report and the 2012 priority and quality of service recommendations for the FirstNet network to reflect all the recent advances in LTE technology and a better understanding of how LTE will impact public safety operations. So various agencies participate in all of these groups. Uh, the DHS Office of Emergency Communications continues to examine the future of priority services as it migrates to LTE and 4G. So basically government moving forward to what industry has done for several years, uh, hopefully going forward a lot more quickly now. Working with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, as well as the uh, Department of Defense CIO and the Defense Information Systems Agency. Um, in order to facilitate privacy access on the NPSBN, the XCOM has an objective related to priority communications, as we just talked about, specifically to review existing policies and requirements and how we identify a way to ensure priority telecoms are effectively uh, and efficiently you know, transitioned from copper to, to uh, fiber. Um, on the NSTAC report to the President on cloud computing, yeah, there's more. Uh, since the report's release, the government specifically, we at DHS, the General Services Administration, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, or NIST, we've all incorporated the aspects of the NSTAC's <coughs> recommendations in its activities to advance cloud, cloud computing initiatives across all federal departments and agencies. On your recommendation to include NSCP service level agreements, or SLAs, in all contracts pertaining to NSCP cloud computing, NIST is working with the international community through the international standards organizations and the International Electrotechnical Commission to uh, develop an overview of SLAs for cloud services, identify the relationships between master service agreement for the SLA, cloud SLA, and the requirements that can be used to build an overall SLA and identify, finally, terms and metrics. Regarding your recommendation to expand FedRAMP to embrace government information systems reportable under the FedRAMP Information Security Management Act, as being of Federal Information Processing Standards, or FIPS, as you know. 199 high risk impact level. FedRAMP did release a draft high baseline requirements in January of 2015, authorizing cloud service providers to host sensitive data. And FedRAMP does anticipate releasing a second draft of the requirements in the summer of 2015, 
and releasing the final version by the end of 2015. So we do work very hard to implement your recommendations, but we're always open. We are a customer service organization, and we're always open to getting better, and we truly want to hear how we can not only implement your recommendations better, but how we use your good work uh, to be a better government forward. Thank you. Thank you, Foss. That's great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Minutes. nine minutes and 47 seconds. No, just, uh, <laughs> that, that, There's a lot there. <laughs> you have 13 more seconds now. <laughs> uh, I yield them to th the chair. Right? Thank you for, for that. Uh, there was actually a lot there, but um, for those who have been on NSTAC for a while, Phyllis was going back a, a, a few years, actually, on some of the uh, some of the topics, so I'm glad to hear the updates on the ones that are not just the most recent as well, because uh, they get deeper, you know, in, into uh, policy, which is great, and it's gratifying to see the work actually turning up in the, you know, in the government. So thank you for that. Are there any questions or comments for Phyllis under that? Great. Okay. Well, uh, next uh, item on the agenda is uh, to hear from Bill and Lisa for an update on the, um, the committee you guys are running on big data analytics. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Mark. Last year, we decided our next tasking would be to examine the subject of big data analytics in the context of national security and emergency preparedness. I was honored to be appointed as co-chair of this committee and so pleased to be joined by my colleague Bill Brown, the CEO of Harris Corporation. In 2014, the NSTAC, as Dr. Schneck just described, studied the Internet of Things, and the big data study is a logical extension to that effort. Thanks to smartphones, wearable devices, social media, and sensors being put on nearly every device imaginable, each of us and our many things are generating data at an unprecedented rate. It's been calculated that an astonishing 90% of the world's data was generated in just the past two years. Moreover, it's expected that by 2020, the amount of digital information in existence will have grown tenfold. Analyzing this big data has the potential to enable improved outcomes for both national security and emergency preparedness by increasing the ability to rapidly identify a broader set of potential threats protect critical systems and share information to better respond to imminent or actual national security or emergency situations. We're now examining how currently available government and commercial data sets and data modeling tools could better be used for national security and emergency preparedness, what industry best practices are for applying big data analytics, and what potential policy and technical challenges exist in doing so. Events such as Hurricane Sandy are recent examples of where big data analytics could have played a pivotal role both before and after the storm in organizing evacuation routes and aiding response and recovery efforts. Disasters similar to Hurricane Sandy, both man-made and natural, will happen again. Our mission is to create a policy environment that not only meets today's needs, but crucially prepares us for tomorrow's concerns. Bill? Thank you very much, Lisa. So as part of the scoping process, the subcommittee is being briefed by a variety of subject matter, matter experts in both the private sector, in the government sector, and within academia. The team's already been briefed by representatives from General Electric, from Ericsson, from NASA, DHS, NSF, George Mason, Mason University, and MIT. In the coming weeks, we'll hear from others, including T.J. Kennedy from FirstNet and representatives from the Red Cross and the CDC. We plan to have a scoping document outlining our goals and objectives ready for subcommittee approval this summer, with the final report complete one year from now in May of 2016. The study will provide policy recommendations and regulatory guidance for all branches of government, including those that are chartered with NSEP responsibilities. So thanks for the opportunity to present our progress. We'd welcome any advice, input from anyone here today. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Bill or Lisa? Great. Well, thank you again for yep. taking the uh, subcommittee on. We look forward to hearing a progress report in August. August. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we don't have a public comment uh, period today since there were no public comments. We're coming down to the end here. But I want to take a point of order uh, to, to recognize uh, somebody who's been supporting the NSTAC for some time and is moving on, uh, which is Sherry Caddy, who's at the end of the table there, Sherry. And, um, <laughs> If you'll, if you'll give me just a minute, I'd like to read into the record a uh, letter of commendation that will be presented to you after the meeting today. This is for Shari Caddy. 
uh, while serving as a primary staff member of the executive office of the president responsible for matters related to the president's NSTAC, Ms. Caddy's intellectual vision, professional dedication, and tireless devotion were instrumental in achieving and maintaining a standard of excellence that raised NSTAC to new heights of relevance, responsiveness, and stature. For more than two years, Ms. Caddy worked tirelessly to guide NSTAC work plans and finish reports through complex governmental staffing, delivering timely guidance and advice to myriad federal organizations as well as NSTAC leaders and industry counterparts. In so doing, she ensured that finished NSTAC policy advice to the President was known by and made available to offices and organizations inside the EOP and across government, achieving optimal benefits to national security and emergency preparedness. Her staffing efforts in coordination with senior White House and other government officials plus NSTAC leaders yielded understanding at the highest levels to fuel ongoing NSTAC work in response to presidential concerns and priorities. In her daily interaction with counterparts in government and industry, Ms. Caddy unfailingly displayed tact, focus, professionalism, and through it all, good humor, approachability, and even-handed balance, even under stress. I'm sure there's a lot of that. It is difficult to overstate the effect of Ms. Caddy's professional tenure, as it will be to replace her in her current role. Though those, all those in government and industry who work in relation to the NSTAC owe her a great debt of gratitude and deep appreciation for long and dedicated service. And on behalf of the NSTAC, thank you very much. It was very evident to those in the leadership positions how much work you were doing, so we really appreciate it. And the best of luck in your new role. So thank you, Sherry. I'll do it at the end. Suzanne, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make? Uh, no, just again to thank everyone. I, Phyllis's recita recitation, I hope, uh, co uh, conveys to you very strongly the difference that you're making. Uh, you have uh, made this commitment to public service, even uh, as members of the private sector. And as I say to my workforce, particularly this week during Public Service Recognition Week, uh, I believe that that decision to play a, to, to give that public service uh, is made because you want to make a difference. And, uh, and I hope that that helped you to, uh, to understand the ways in which you really are making a difference to advance the national security emergency preparedness of this country. And I'm extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Michael? just wanted to say uh, thank you to all the members for putting in the time uh, and effort uh, on both the studies, but coming here and participating in the discussions uh, today. I think they've been very uh, productive, and I've uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you in particular to uh, Mark and Renee for your leadership uh, on the INSTAC. It's been a great uh, partnership, um, and I look forward to uh, continuing that. Um, thanks to all the POCs for all the work that goes on behind the scenes to make all of your principals look smart, because um, I know how that works. Um, so we appreciate, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and I look forward to uh, continuing uh, our efforts. And I also want to uh, just uh, say my personal thanks to Sherry on my staff, who has really worked hard to make me look good uh, in these meetings uh, as well. She's put in a tremendous amount of time and effort. Um, so she will be difficult to uh, replace on that score. Uh, but I look forward to uh, our continuing work uh, on this really uh, important set of topics. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's meeting, especially our uh, the guests who joined us from the NSXB XCOM who are around the table with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for, again for Bill and Lisa for updating us on uh, the committee report and for your leadership around that. Um, the next NSTAC meeting is a phone call on August 12th. So please mark your calendars if you haven't already done so. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask if there's any questions or comments from anybody in the membership. And if not, then I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. Can I have a second? Second. 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 <laughs> so adjourn. Thank you.